session with the Planning Commission, and so we're going to complete this joint session um, and take a roll call. Uh, uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm disappointed. I, I'm ending up set, sitting next to the same people I always sit yeah. at. Next and you're disappointed? you're disappointed? Yeah. Let's you go ahead with the roll call. <laughs> we love you too. <laughs> Commissioner Mum. Here. Commissioner Polly. Here. Commissioner Smith. Here. Commissioner Roth. Here. Commissioner Hankin. Tomorrow. Commissioner Maybe. Here. Commissioner Mahoney. Here. Commissioner Espy. Here. Commissioner Kidwell. Here. Commissioner Guile. Commissioner McGriff. Present. And Mayor Neely. Here. With well, that, we'll go on into our discussion item, the one that we're very fond of, the Willamette Falls Legacy Project Update. Welcome. Mm. How are we going to start off with Tony? Um, I think I'm, yeah, I'll go ahead and start off. Um, and before we get into the presentation, um, I'll just give you an update on some that um, the letter of intent that's been su submitted by Langley Investment Properties. It was submitted to the trustee. Um, so what will happen now, it's very similar to when Eclipse submitted their, their letter, letter of intent. Uh, there is a bankruptcy hearing scheduled for January 3rd, which is 30 days from the filing of the letter of intent. And that's a legal requirement allowing for any overbids or objections uh, from the creditors. And then the general terms of the, uh, the agreement are a purchase price of $4.9 million if the closing occurs within 12 months and $5.75 million if Langley closes within 24 months. Um, so we're kind of in that 30-day window again uh, where we're waiting until the, the court hearing on January 3rd. And from then we'll know a little bit more information about that. A couple of questions? What was the last selling price? Wasn't it 4.3? Mm -hmm. I believe so. 4.1? 4.1. So your tax base is already growing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. And then um, if they take the 24-month option, that takes it off the market for 24 months? Uh, yes. They'd be under contract as long as um, mm -hmm. all the other parts of the contract or obligations are being met. Okay. Thank you. Tony, has this got uh, Langley development from Portland? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay. I am familiar with him. So w with that, that's that's the update that I have concerning the letter of intent in um, Langley Investment Properties. And we'll go ahead and call up our um, consultant team here to begin the presentation for tonight. Good to see you again. It's been a long time. <laughs> Not very. <laughs> Much bigger than probably most of you last saw me. <laughs> <laughs> Our team is growing. Bigger and better. The team yeah. is growing. Yeah, it's, it's I was just uh, telling Mike the day that we interviewed on this project, I'd found out I was pregnant two days before. So I was <laughs> like, oh, two really big things happening this year. <laughs> 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 Let's see how that goes. It's going well. Yeah. Um, so is there a slide for the process one first? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll kick off this evening really briefly with, um, this is a process slide, which I know everyone in this room is probably very familiar with at this point. Um, it's, we'll be using it on Thursday at the community event to kind of clarify a little bit better for folks what's happened previously, happening now, and then into especially the first six months of next year and then kind of beyond that so that there is a, a concept for this implementation process moving forward. But on that left-hand side, you see that what we've been working on is developing the framework master plan and vision, especially for the past six months. Um, we've done visioning, community engagement, development research, alternative concepts development, and we're about to present what you'll see this evening, um, the final concept and demonstration plans. And then that double kind of bullseye highlight, just really focusing on the next six months. So that land use application process, the submittal, uh, the commission and uh, city, the commission hearings, uh, city and planning commission, and then um, ideally towards approval in July and August of next year. So we've been moving in great cadence, uh, very fast project timeline, but it's been feeling really great. And the community engagement has been fantastic, which has really helped to inform a lot of our concepts. And I'm gonna give you, I know we have a good presentation tonight and we wanna have time for your comments. So I'm gonna give you a quick update. Um, I believe the last time there was a joint meeting, Kirsten Green from Kogan Owens Kogan was able to give the update. And so I'll review a little bit of the old stuff and then kind of jump into the new. Uh, since we've seen since we've seen you, um, well, since we kicked off our first community event, which was the July 27th First City Festival, we've had um, a little bit over 4,000 unique contacts and comments with Oregonians uh, in the city, 
and in the region and a little bit outside as well if we look at Facebook we can see some people are kind of commenting from Medford or from Ashland because they're just interested in the Limit Falls project um, but uh, the First Week Festival itself had over a thousand unique comments just at that event that we were able to use to help shape vision and then we had opt-in one that Metro online opinion panel for the first round of surveys that garnered 2,100 uh, survey responses that were also able to help us um, identify a vision to create alternative concepts. From that, October 10th, we had our second community event and it was held at the um, Museum of the Oregon Territory and we had over 130 participants attend. It was a hugely successful event. It was a really robust discussion, conversation. We were able to have a fantastic presentation and then um, people got into small groups with facilitators and we had volunteer note takers from Minnesota, it was great, mm -hmm. from this university graduate trip that was coming through and they all volunteered to help us with our process. <laughs> <laughs> it was really great. So I have wonderful notes that was able, it was actually really great for us because I was able to capture um, verbatim comments basically from each table discussion that we were also able to use to help refine the concepts um, that we presented at that meeting and you'll see the results of that today. Um, but at that same time, we also launched the second opt-in survey um, and also just survey through the website. And will you raise your hand if you did take the Metro opt-in survey or the one that was on the website? So most people have seen it. Great, so that was really fantastic. We had 1,900 people participate in that. And so some of them are new people and some of them are people that took it before and I don't have a way actually of knowing since it is anonymous. But we have a lot of data um, from that it is uploaded to the project website um, one of the most striking things about it is that we actually asked DHM to break it out by county for us because I was like well what's Clackamas County saying versus Multnomah or Washington mm -hmm. County they're all saying very similar things which is actually quite heartening so that we understand mm -hmm. that across the region there is a general sentiment and if you want to look at that those raw numbers I know Christina brought one hard copy tonight if you want to take a peek at what the county um, counties are saying by county, but you can also download it from the internet. Um, let's see here. I'm tempted to go through a lot of the information, but I know a lot of it's also in the presentation. So I'll hold off, and if there are additional community engagement questions, I think afterwards I'd be happy to go over them with you. Oh, sorry, next steps. <laughs> I have more things to say. <laughs> so community event number three, um, it is in two days, Thursday night. Um, at the Ainsworth, yes, Mayor Neely has a flyer. Um, yes, Mayor Neely, I'm going to ask you to do the introduction and opening again. I'll give you notes. <laughs> um, it's at the Ainsworth House and Gardens this time, not at the Museum of the Oregon Territory, but I think it's going to be a great space and a great event. It'll be a little bit more of an open house style this time since we are at Final Concepts and we're not looking for such a robust, in-depth group discussion amongst everyone, but really sort of a here's what's happening, let's get your feedback on this final concept and go forward from there because we still have a little bit of time for refinement if needed. Um, the partners groups, which is the meeting of all of the elected officials from each of the partners, our third meeting will be on January 13th um, with them and that leads up to the regional community event at the Keen Warehouse. Um, so Keen is a company that's based here in Portland, they make shoes and I'm sure other outdoorsy things, but they've offered us I think for 200 bucks, their warehouse space in the Pearl District. So nice. we're going to be able to have a fantastic <laughs> celebration to go over everything that we've done. Um, February 6th, it actually also coincides with First Thursday, so the streets will be alive with music and um, celebration. And then um, we'll move into the application submittal, partners group four at the end, um, right before the planning commission hearing, and then the processes you all are well familiar with and then anticipated adoption hopefully late summer. Okay. Thank you. So in the community event, many of you were there I believe, but uh, we asked some questions about what inspired the group, uh, what, what were things that we missed, and what would keep people involved. We got a tremendous amount of input. Uh, that input in, in, in addition to the, uh, the opt-in survey and, and other items have, have kind of led us to the plan we're presenting tonight. So as you're very aware, um, the site is 23 acres. Uh, it was formerly the Blue Heron Paper Company and many other things. And uh, there's nothing like this place in, in Oregon or in the Western United States. Uh, it's got tremendous quality uh, even after the salvage company's gone through. Um, there's lots of quality to the site. And these qualities were 
uh, putting in the plan and uh, really taking note of them. Uh, there's a history there that is really evident uh, for those of you that, that have been to the place. Uh, and you can see it, for example, just in the different walls and the different textures of the place. And those are all incorporated in the thinking of the plan. It's also interesting that it's a place of transfer between the upper and lower river. It always has been uh, starting, uh, you know, Native American times as a trading area and uh, tribal area and also then through the history of, of settlement uh, since then. And that's really important to the site because we have different personalities uh, for the site that we like to uh, really highlight. Uh, it's all about water. There's water falling everywhere, especially right now. Um, uh, and obviously the falls are the big draw. They have a very different personality throughout the season, throughout the year. Um, and one of the challenges of bringing tourism out to this area is interpreting the falls because it has a very different character in July than it does in November. Mm -hmm. And how, how we bring people to the falls and what, we, what the story is will be really important. Uh, there's also a tremendous connection uh, to the upper river, which many people don't realize, I think, right now in Oregon City because they haven't been to the site yet. Uh, but when you look from the lagoon uh, upstream, it's very <coughs> passive, very, very calm, very beautiful. And connecting uh, the city at this level uh, to the river will be really important. And then water spills throughout the whole site. There, this, this, on the, the spilling you see uh, on the left is uh, over the dam, but there's also uh, tail races and other things that flow through. And then there's also a different quality of water at, uh, below the falls. So uh, all those personalities we're trying to really take advantage of, because that really is a, re or a real characteristic of the place. Uh, as you're aware, there are four uh, core values that were established through the partners. And these core values have really uh, so far held uh, through all the conversations. It's really held the group together because uh, essentially everyone is buying into the balance of these four items. The question uh, that will be answered in, in future development is, is how that balance is met. Um, you know, through economic development, healthy habitat, public access, and importantly, the historic and cultural interpretation. So what we'd like to do is just briefly go through the thinking uh, by core value, just to kind of keep it organized that way. They're all interrelated, but uh, it kind of helps uh, the conversation. Through the opt-in survey and the public process, we've gotten tremendous amount of support, uh, as well as interesting ideas from the, uh, <clears throat> from the community at large, uh, many of which are focused on uh, not only the kind of pioneering history and the industrial history, but the history before that honoring the Native Americans, honoring the, the natural area. And that's uh, really important to people's perception of the place. Uh, as you're aware, this was a very special place, still is. Uh, and it was a place of trade and a place of uh, gathering of food. Um, it was also a ceremonial place. And all of those elements we'd like to build back in to the site. Uh, it's still used by Native Americans for, uh, for collecting ceremonial uh, elements like eels excuse me, lamprey fish. I mean, I'd say that every time. <laughs> there are eels back where I come from. And, um, and, and then, it, as you know, it was a pioneer town, and there's a lot of history and, and uh, uh, specialness to that, to the development of Oregon City. Uh, as industry came in, uh, the, the, the place continually changed. One of the things we've really taken heart in is how this place has never uh, stayed the same. It's always been changing always and continues to change and changes again. And uh, that's why it's so exciting for us to be part of this next change. Uh, you can see this is the lower river and this is where uh, transfer of goods and, and people occurred. Uh, you can also see the tail races that were flowing through the site. <clears throat> Some of those are still there. You just can't see them. They're under platforms and things. Mm -hmm. It was a place that uh, the ancient forests of Oregon uh, were floated downstream and, and uh, milled uh, in the pulp. Uh, so there was a whole heritage of kind of the connection to the natural environment. And it was also, and still is, a place of, of catastrophic floods. So floods would come through the area and really devastate the place. Uh, and then workers would go right back out the next day and start building again and build and, and sometimes build a whole new industry. Those buildings you see there, uh, their foundations and some of their equipment are still in place. Those things are still sitting out there. So the interpretation of that history and the acknowledgement of what happened there is very important. There's also a, a real uh, tremendous tradition of industrial buildings that came in after the initial pioneer kind of town was, was uh, moved north. 
uh, and many of these structures are still there. They've been greatly manipulated, but they still have real quality to them. For example, the de-ink building, number four paper machine. This was what was in the building at the time, and after salvage, this is the way it looks. So now we have a place that is kind of open for business, if you will, to be redeveloped into something interesting. And it's really wonderful to go in to see the volume of these spaces. There are challenges, as Kevin will point out, about how these are incorporated into redevelopment, but they can be incorporated. And uh, obviously the other buildings on the site, there are, there are elements on the site that aren't buildings, but still have a great history like the woolen mill foundations, as well as the industrial elements that are left after the salvage. Um, some of these are just tremendous when you, when you uh, come in contact with them. So what we've been looking at with our team, and not only with GBD and Kevin Johnson here, but uh, with our historic architects, um, have been looking at the qualities of the, of the structures and their, their ability to be uh, redeveloped. We are not in a position right now to uh, say these are the only structures or the, there shouldn't be these structures, but we're looking at the potential. So there's 50 plus structures on the site. There's been studies of that. Uh, and these are the ones we highlight here are the ones that first come to our minds that have the potential. There's also all these other elements there, um, including the industrial areas. It's the big. And uh, it's, uh, so there's a wide variety of things that could uh, be incorporated. Then we've uh, gone on tour is our favorite shot of the whole show. Um, <laughs> the, uh, we've engaged, I love it. engaged um, the tribes and brought them out, and they're very interested in reconnecting with this place. It's still very important to their culture, and they're, they're just fascinated with the potential of being reconnected in a real way uh, to the falls and to the site. I should mention too, their, their respect for the place goes beyond just the waterfall. It's actually the entire setting of the place. And how we interpret uh, their use of the place and courage uh, ceremonies and other things are still to come, come as the plan gets further developed. Uh, we've looked at a wide variety of, of uh, precedents and there are many uh, very successfully incorporating historic uh, elements into revitalized sites. This, is, this one happens to be in uh, Cape Town. Uh, but there are others of, of varying uh, qualities, this in Germany uh, and even in Mexico where you know, ceremonies can occur and all kinds of things and the industrial kind of quality of the place still remains. The other uh, next core value is access and this is the one that uh, the public is very focused on. Uh, people are just really excited about the potential of uh, coming out to this place and there's lots of challenges there but uh, just a tremendous amount of energy uh, related to getting connected to this place again and many many people have never been there um, and uh, we've, we've got all kinds of input but primarily it's related to activities that could occur here and providing uh, a variety of ways of uh, getting here on foot on bike and by vehicle and mass transit um, there's things that uh, we were reminded through the process about don't forget the kids and that this should very much be a family place. It should be for places, people of all ages. And then up, that thing in the upper right is the one we really want to do, which is gigantic teeter-totters. So, <laughs> so, so that's a given. We're going to do that one. Oh, but anyway, trying to, like try, trying to build some really interesting places uh, that attract folks it would be great. Um, and then, of course, it's about the water. And we've had lots of input about connections to and on and uh, along the waterfront. So the site is outlined in red, um, and uh, one of the access issues that have been discussed uh, quite a bit is the vehicular access. As you know, it's uh, zoned industrial. There's a certain amount of vehicles that came and went from the main gate, and as it redevelops, there's likely to be many more vehicles. So we've done some preliminary looks at how many vehicles and how they might access. We're working hand in glove with ODOT about access to the site. Uh, and there's been a lot of conversation primarily about this intersection, this is at Main and Highway 99, and how to accommodate vehicles turning into the site, uh, but also allowing pedestrians to come across the, the uh, intersection carefully, or not carefully, but um, seamlessly. Uh, what we don't want to do is set up a system where it works great for the cars, but pedestrians can't walk up Main and walk right into the site, so we're trying to balance those things. And there's lots of parts and pieces to it. Um, how cars go underneath the, <clears throat> the uh, railroad, uh, how 99 works even above the site. There's been discussions of access down 
from the upper part uh, and how people connect uh, at the curve there. Uh, this is just some of the options. There's over, well over 20 options have been studied about big moves, providing routes, say, from above and down into the site, uh, rebuilding the bridge, doing all kinds of things. And what we've discovered through these conversations is that there are simpler and more direct fixes that will allow access to occur. And we're in a series of conversations with ODOT right now about how to provide additional access to the site that still maintains uh, kind of the, the clarity of downtown, uh, doesn't require major bridges and gigantic kind of infrastructure projects, but meets the needs of Highway 99. And this is uh, a brief diagram that just describes uh, a new light uh, at 6th, a new access at, at water, which is along the street, or along the river, excuse me, um, and uh, how the lights would work in lanes and that sort of thing. We can answer questions about that later, but we're very encouraged by this uh, conversation because it looks very attainable uh, to uh, really a attract and allow people to get into the site uh, safely. Um, uh, there's also a, a proposed uh, MMA, which is a uh, multimodal mixed-use area designation for downtown. You can see the site on the left and downtown on the kind of across the, uh, the center of the drawing. Um, and there's a conversation going on with ODOT and eventually with the state about a designation. And what it is, is it's really looking at all the different modes of circulation uh, and how they work best for the site. Looking back at the history, this was always, this was town. Uh, so the grid of the, the city was here. Uh, the yellow is there just to kind of get you oriented to where 99 is today. But you can see a grid of streets, Main Street moving right into the site fourth and third coming down and even Water Street uh, along the bottom of the drawing there along the, uh, the river. Mm. Uh, those streets are what we're proposing to reestablish, those, those uh, right-of-ways. Um, and they work very well for redevelopment, which Kevin will talk about in a minute. They work well for circulation and as we're looking at it now, it'll work well for access uh, from downtown. Main Street used to be uh, quite celebrated as, a, as one entered uh, the mill. It was very, very well connected, uh, and it's still there. Main Street still exists. And the good news is, uh, by simply connecting uh, to downtown, we, we think there would be a beautiful draw for people to come to the site and to the falls. Uh, so our proposal is to reestablish Main Street. You can see it through the middle of the slide there. Uh, fourth and third would be uh, right-of-ways. They may be uh, partially vehicular, they may be entirely. They will, of course, always accommodate bicycles and pedestrians, reestablish Water Street, and connect into the site. The other important item, of course, is the connection along the waterfront. And there's lots of industrial items along there that we like to interpret and connect people to. And uh, what we found is people really enjoy getting below the top of bank. It's interesting to walk on a promenade, but folks are really intrigued by getting down lower. So we're looking at ways of engaging folks along the river. There is a dock there that we're, we're looking at to see uh, exactly how the ownership works. This would be a tremendous asset. People are very interested in having, a, having access to the dock. But we still have some of these right-of-ways and these connections that we can use. This is looking directly into the site uh, at the old alignment of, uh, of Water Street. One, our proposal is to uh, reconnect the street. You can see it on the left there um, and make it a vehicular way, but also extend your promenade directly into the site so it becomes a major waterfront connection, direct connection visually to the, to the water uh, and into the site. And it is a, it's a nice city street that kind of enters uh, just adjacent to the redevelopment. So you can see that water street labeled on the drawing. The other very important item, of course, is pedestrian way from there all the way through the site in orange. And we are proposing, uh, we'll show you a variety of ways that it can occur, but the main idea is to connect pedestrians from your promenade into the site and out to the falls, which is on the, the upper right, and then also out along uh, to Kanima. This is still a place that floods. This is the 96 flood. And this is a photograph of folks up on 99 looking down at the site. So one can imagine uh, what was actually happening on the site at the time. The buildings across the way, for example, that building on the left, uh, that's uh, two or three stories up where the water is coursing against the building. So that's a very significant uh, aspect of this place. When we look at where that, that flood occurred in 96, uh, it's in the blue area primarily. Uh, there's still a lot of 
depending on how it gets redeveloped, that line will adjust slightly, but that's basically where the line is. And those are the, those are the blocks that will be most difficult to redevelop. Uh, our proposal is they should be uh, primarily open space with some redevelopment depending on the height and the structure. So those areas could be the place that draw people directly out to the falls and the water. Um, and I mentioned those elements along the riverbank, uh, that large concrete area uh, element to the left is an old uh, tie-up uh, zone. Uh, maybe that could become a platform that folks could come out along the riverbank and connect uh, directly and look down at the water. Uh, out at the falls, the yellow area is lovingly referred to as the dance floor by PGE. Um, <laughs> that's an area that is, it's the spot. It's the spot that you want to be when, when you go see the falls because you're right there. And there's lots of examples. This is a slightly bigger fall, but the idea is that uh, getting people in contact with that power of the waterfall is, is really important. Uh, the walkway out along the dam uh, was industrialized, obviously. That can be rehabilitated. We've talked, we're in conversations with PG about how best to do that, but we see it as a pedestrian way to draw people out uh, directly out to the water and get in contact, in this case, with the lagoon on the left and the falls out in front. Looking back now into the site, the industrialized uh, lagoon area, we have some buildings there that could be rehabilitated. Uh, we can provide uh, light watercraft access into that lagoon. Uh, we're looking to clean, clean the water. We'll talk about flowing water through it in a minute. The buildings could be rehabilitated. Some could be removed. Um, and a park could be created or all the buildings could be pulled off of that site and that could be a wonderful open space at the end of Main Street. So those all, all, all of those potentials are still available uh, in the framework plan. There's a clarifier next to the dam. Um, we're now kind of moving downstream. Uh, that could be removed, and there's a, there's a real benefit to uh, the habitat uh, and uh, the kind of plants that grow there that could uh, be reestablished. Or it could be partially removed and turned into an overlook. Looking further down, this is the complicated area. We call it the catacombs because there's so many different elements uh, in it. This is layer and layer and layer of industry. Um, and it's, it's also within the floodplain. So we see this as a great potential for uh, primarily open space and uh, access. This is taken from up in that building looking out the falls because you imagine if that was an overlook, uh, just what a beautiful view you would have. Uh, this is a very simple section through that area just showing the water that's still flowing through it, but it's just layer and layer of platforms and, and columns uh, throughout there. There's a view underneath. So it's a pretty complicated place. Uh, but if you imagine stripping away some of the industrial buildings there, uh, this could be a really wonderful set of platforms and places for people to look at and to uh, engage. And there's lots of examples throughout the world. This is in Minneapolis uh, where they did such, such a thing, where they left parts, but they also encouraged people to come out and engage in the industrial <coughs> heritage. Uh, in Sydney, Australia, they did a wonderful job, we believe, of, of removing a uh, petroleum plant and building an open space and they kept true to the place so the, the walls are still there and they cut through and provided access. Another important core value is healthy habitat. Uh, <coughs> lots of people uh, have opinions about that. Uh, we do have potential uh, primarily for migratory fish and birds. That's, that's the, big, the big thing to do here. It's a rocky site. It never has been a vegetated site. Uh, but providing places for birds and fish to rest as they move up and down is very important. It's in an interesting environmental area. You can see it in orange there. It's, it's really within this zone uh, of other uh, environmentally benefit pla benefit beneficial places. Um, and uh, it should take a role in connecting. Um, as I mentioned, there are some unique environmental aspects to how the rocks work. There are plants that grow there that don't grow anywhere else because of the spray and the mist from the falls. Uh, on the lower left is uh, the river bank further down towards downtown, which could be restored. Uh, so we have lots of potential. What we've learned from the biologists and from uh, speaking with uh, different ecologists with the state and federal uh, governments is that one of the best things we can do is re-roughen the bank, if you will, make it a, make indentations and in places along the edges of the river bank so that uh, migratory fish can rest. That's the best thing we can do there. Um, it's not a place we can grow a lot of plants down at the base, but if we can allow those pockets to occur, that would be great. Uh, also, we're interested in reestablishing a flow through what became the tail races. 
um, and there's some interpretation of uh, capability there and just a real interesting uh, educational uh, component. So in general, we are, we are proposing to reestablish um, native vegetation where possible on the riverbank, create water flow through some of those tail races to create kind of fresh water coming out into the, into, uh, into the lower river. We'd like to re-establish the flow through the lagoon. Right now it's stagnant because the industrial water is not being drawn out, so we want to clean that water and uh, make, it a, make it healthier and uh, establish vegetation up along the riverbank towards Kanema. Some of the things we're looking at uh, building into the plan are shallow water habitat, vegetation lower down on the bank where we can, uh, where there's soil, and uh, trees. Looking up towards Kanema, there is a spur line there that uh, has a great potential. Uh, again, this is that, that beautiful calm water place. There is vegetation along the edge that could be uh, added to, invasive species could be removed, uh, and it just could be a really wonderful place for people and animals. This is how it looks today. Uh, there's a lot of invasive species uh, you can see on the right. Um, and what we're envisioning is a trail that could move up and re replanting the, the edge of the river so we, we have beneficial vegetation there. And then on to economic development. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> so I'm Kevin Johnson, GBD Architects. And as you've um, heard from before, we've had Eco Northwest and, and Lokai who have been working on the development aspects <clears throat> of this. And I'll speak for them since I couldn't make the meeting tonight. But uh, let me figure out which button I've got well, here. Right. That works. So again, equal amount of interest, certainly in this of the four core values. The, um, and actually, since we've last met, we've taken a deeper look into the market constraints and opportunities and achievable rents. And we've explored different types and potential development and uses, all factoring into significant open spaces with uses ranging from multifamily, residential, retail, industrial, institutional, parking, have gone through the gamut of those, those items. And, and also <clears throat> from that, then crafted three preliminary uh, frameworks for development, each emphasizing different mix of all the building um, uh, uh, of all the different building types, but, but primarily, again, kind of returning to those four core values in each case. So some examples here of some of the uh, uh, potential uses in these images, um, uh, what's possible in light industrial, and there's uh, great apparel uh, in the region already at this point. There's talent there. The challenge is how to make the site more competitive to attract that business to it. Um, educational uses as well, um, technology, food, um, arts. Uh, when we say our educational, you know, think of, of what University of Oregon has done with uh, with the White Stag building in Portland, oh, yeah. you know, to bring in uh, to that existing building there. So some really, really nice uh, clues and opportunities in that. Um, and certainly, overall, a mixture of uses is what, what this will actually uh, ideally uh, turn into. Um, adaptive reuse of some of the existing buildings as well as new construction, as shown here on the right, that, uh, that formulates itself well into the context of the existing buildings, um, <clears throat> along with the open spaces. And, and uh, we certainly need to cost these, identify uh, most likely market viabilities, uh, create a public-private toolkit uh, that can make development happen, and uh, craft realistic phasing plans. Uh, we tested various mixed-use scenarios. <clears throat> Used the scenario um, it did work in the terms of the market feasibility and market and parking analysis. Um, all of them could work. I think that's that's the the takeaway is that we we have the kind of ahas that they they all do work well together on the site, um, and we can allow a fair, fair amount of flexibility uh, in that private development. So again, as Mike said, the the uh, existing main street and uh, the importance of carrying that into. Um, the new development. <clears throat> the existing Main Street, I, I, we think, can really gain new vitality because of this connection. Um, it's got great bones, what we like to say, as far as existing buildings that are there, the streetscape uh, and all that. And so whereas it terminates right now, uh, we think it'll really be enhanced by its opening up into the new site uh, with new amenities. And that the old would complement the new. Let me take a little quick look back and forth here. So yeah, so then again, in the in the new site, uh, the new development of the the Blue Heron site, um, it has bundled assets uh, that make it unique in the region and state. It's got the amenities of the fall and the river. Um, it's got the adjacent revitalized downtown, existing buildings, large floor plates uh, can be done here. Uh, potential of multi uses in the same building. 
uh, for companies that need larger spaces, and that's a unique uh, need um, in our area, is looking for larger floor plates. And we've got a great opportunity for that with the, with the uh, site development as, as being talked about now. Uh, as Mike said, there's some existing um, pieces to start with uh, and looking at how we integrate those into the site. Uh, and along with the dramatic water uh, uh, flooding that Mike showed earlier, you know, that does leave then these areas of the site that are significant and uh, most easily understood for development. Uh, those pieces there come to 6.7 acres. That's just in the floor plan of them. That's not the built up um, size, uh, hot, uh, size of them potentially. Um, when we look at your existing downtown, that's about that much square footage in your existing downtown, again, just as the floor um, uh, ground surface. Then there's those other areas that are in the uh, kind of green zone, the buffer zone, as, as Mike alluded to in the, in the potential water uh, access zone. But there is still development opportunities in there. There definitely is. And so um, while we've seen the 6.7 acres in the, uh, in the uh, uh, previous slide, uh, there's, there's a significant amount of additional acreage and space in there as well. Uh, it'll take a unique development, but we think that uh, there's some really great opportunity there. Actually, so... Let me just kind of finish on the economic side of it and then go into the architectural a little bit. Um, it's clear it's going to take uh, a public-private partnership, uh, a mix of funding tools to prepare the site, uh, addressing the need for infrastructure and closing the financial gaps. Uh, we believe that the proposed open space and uniqueness of Willamette Falls can fundamentally change the current real estate market on site. However, many things will need to align to make this happen. and. The whole thing begins to fall apart if we don't stay true to those four core values. I think that's really the emphasis here is that they work as synergy and they're inter interdependent upon each other. So f the economic side of this is, is going to gain great value from those other four, the other three values as well. Architecturally, to look at it a little bit, um, this slide gives a bit of the clues about the height of the site. I was showing earlier just the floor plates, but then when we talk about massing this up to take the heights, the existing structures there are pretty significant. They're pretty tall, um, yet Mother Nature's taller. So when we look at the bluff uh, on the side there, we feel like there's a lot of room to do development inside of that, that, um, uh, that constraint, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we look at then replacing some of those existing structures with new uh, and just doing some simple massing, a couple clues come into, into this view. One is the heights. We can build well underneath that promenade view down. But also it starts to speak a little bit about where parking can occur. And in the one side we've got where the, where the uh, highway is and the rail line, maybe parking can be helped to buffer that side of the equation and build up some of the backside there. And then at the same time, each one of these sites is going to want to park itself. People are going to want to arrive, park workshop, et cetera. So we're looking at some floor plates on the uh, um, uh, open sites as well that would go above. We know that the ground uh, is either solid basalt or it is the catacombs. So the parking down below is probably, uh, from a developer standpoint, it's probably not going to be our first choice for sure. We'll be looking at building it up above. Um, so that then weighs back into and lays back into these floor plates here. Again, we've looked at how those kind of mass up. And, and uh, um, again, there's a lot of, a lot of flexibility in those as we see them. Um, and um, certainly talking about parking as well, as was mentioned earlier um, in those sections, uh, we do feel there's a significant amount of opportunity for parking. We've been kind of massing in the basic amounts that would work for the development, but we also have uh, some close proximity to your existing downtown. We feel like we could be building extra parking into the new development that would, that would be an amenity to your, your uh, existing downtown space as well. I think I'll hand it over to you at this point. Yep. Mike. Yep. <coughs> so, um, just, uh, just to keep in mind what we're actually trying to accomplish here, uh, we're trying to establish a framework plan. And that framework plan is intended to uh, encourage development uh, that's, uh, you know, that, is, that is beneficial to Oregon City and to downtown. Uh, the basic framework that we're proposing uh, and that we're proposing to carry through the next process with the Planning Commission uh, is this one. So it's a simple street grid. Um, it's development blocks and it's areas for uh, pedestrian and uh, uh, connections to nature. So it's a really simple system. And um, what we found, it helps us, uh, hopefully it'll help you and it'll help the public understand what this might look and feel like, is we've developed some demonstration plans. These are not plans that will, will necessarily be developed this way, but it kind of shows uh, you and others uh, what it might look and feel like. So uh, we've, we've done three because we wanted to kind of show the variety of things that could happen. Um, 
the uh, the blocks one, two, five, six, and seven are are consistent in this on these drawings because there's so many variations. Uh, it, you know, we didn't need to draw them all, but the point is it could accommodate all the different uses that Kevin was talking about. It could incorporate uh, many of the historic structures. You can see the red uh, kind of rectangles on block six and seven. Those are those two buildings we've been talking about, but there are others that could be incorporated. Uh, the circulation system, Main Street comes through, Water Street and Fourth connect. Uh, and then in this scheme, we've looked at the area down uh, by the catacombs as primarily open space and uh, interpretive area habitat restoration. So there's a there's a kind of an open space uh, emphasis in this this area. Um, as we look at how people circulate, uh, there would be the promenade connection from the north through the site and directly out to the falls as well as to Kenema. And as we think about that primary open space, it could be uh, there for uh, pedestrian, or not pedestrian, but community use, uh, places for gatherings, ceremonies, uh, events. The building on the left in that drawing is Mill O, so that could be incorporated into, into that scheme. Uh, the the uh, O'Woolen Mill foundations are at the upper part of the drawing that could turn into some elements that could also be attractive. Uh, the idea is to create an open space that's connected uh, to Main Street and also provide access down to the riverbank. In another demonstration, uh, we have looked at uh, increasing development uh, in those river edge blocks. Uh, the routing of circulation be, could be different depending on what we leave along the riverbank. Uh, the industrialized, there's some pieces there we can walk on and connect people out to the river. Uh, and you can see that Mill O and, and uh, the foundations of the woolen mill have been shown as redeveloped. Uh, those are, that's very, very possible. And an, another open space could be developed. In this case, it would be higher up on the bank because we left kind of an industrial edge and it would be very much connected to the Main Street edge and be a very lively kind of walk, walk system. And another way to think about it would be a blend uh, where uh, there's a direct connection through the site. Uh, other types of development could occur uh, along the river. Uh, out at the lagoon, you can see there's some buildings uh, along the water. And the, the connections for pedestrians as they come through uh, could have a very uh, varied um, kind of connection depending <laughs> on the height and the location of the, of the walkway. Uh, and then the open space could take on a different character, a little more naturalistic. It kind of, it kind of uh, is sloped down towards the river, so as you sit on the lawn or use the open space, you can be connected. Mill O is redeveloped. Uh, that glass canopy up in the, mill, in the woolen mills it could be an outdoor restaurant or something else. It would be quite interesting uh, incorporating that historical uh, element. Uh, there's lots of examples. This is actually a project that Kevin uh, not only worked on, he works in. Uh, <laughs> so he's living proof. <laughs> um, this is the Burry Blocks in, in downtown Portland where the historic buildings were, uh, many of them were saved and rehabilitated. Uh, the developer in this case actually put quite a bit of money into things like keeping the smokestack. That was something that he just wanted to do because it gave character. And there's a way of, of still being true to the uh, the historic qualities of the place while bringing new life to the buildings. Uh, when we think about Main Street and, uh, and the existing uh, kind of large industrial buildings, we see a great opportunity to rehabilitate those buildings and create a really vital and, and uh, lively uh, Main Street environment uh, and draw people out to the falls. So that's our presentation. Thank you. Any follow-up or just a discussion at this point? I think at this point we'll just open it up for discussion and questions and uh, we went through quite a bit there. Um, so yeah. we'll try and address what, what anything that you bring forward. I have a couple questions. Go ahead. At uh, one point you mentioned rebuild the bridge. What bridge were you talking about? <laughs> Build the bridge. It was uh, early on in the presentation. You're talking about access ways, you know, oh, no, bridges we were, and yeah. Oh, we were talking about the, the um, I, I believe it was when I was talking about access points that could occur. Right. We were looking at all different opportunities for rebuilding. I didn't, I didn't mean the bridge, I meant the underpass. Okay. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> the bridge going. has been rebuilt, I know. Sure. No, I was talking, <laughs> excuse me, I misspoke. No, it was the, uh, it was the, well, the, where the railroad is, 99 comes under it. Okay. So there was a lot of discussion, do we need to add a lane and do we have to reroute the whole highway and that sort of thing. So okay. the bridge, uh, 
might have been also that there were discussions of bringing access off of the upper part of 99 down into the site, mm -hmm. which is extremely expensive, and that is a bridge over the right. over the piece. But no, it's not the arch bridge. Okay. <laughs> um, a second question is, have the streets down there been vacated so that the current owners control them, or is that going to be a problem? They have, they have been vacated, yes. So is that a problem reclaiming those? Um, it's it's part of the land use process, and it's probably a discussion we will want to have with whoever the potential yeah. property owner is. Um, okay. When we do a subdivision or a site plan, we we exact right away dedication. Um, so we'd just be so taking them back again. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a discussion that we need to have. Just yeah. just because we have so many uh, people in this joint session, if you could hit the on the floor piece uh, to get to the discussion mode. For the two on the end who don't have a computer, <laughs> does just wave. It's not working. It's <laughs> so having it not working, take and raise your hand if you have a, a comment. Uh, one question I had, just you know, you're m mentioning the tail races, mm -hmm. and yet in your your structure things, uh, one of one of those ra tail races looked like I was always uh, built over. But I presume even if that were the case, there would still be. There's a lot of room under those under the structures there that there would still be capability of maybe even uh, of well done uh, public access there where they can actually uh, have things under the buildings. Absolutely, absolutely. Or through it, yeah. No, it, no, it, yeah. It, it, or through, that's or through them. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, there's an incredible amount of potential there. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a couple of Go ahead, questions. Um, Kevin, you, when I was looking at the diagram involving the uh, building heights that you had, you mentioned you you maybe inadvertently mentioned that you thought something was a constraint, and and I, I don't see a constraint there. I th I don't think you know we should have any buildings that are obviously taller than the bluff, but we have buildings there that kind of set a precedent, mm -hmm. the existing ones. So I I really wasn't sure if I misunderstood that or, but I, <coughs> I wrote it down. Well, I think I'm, I'm right in line with what you were thinking there, is that there's, there seems to be an awful lot of opportunity there. There's plenty of height. Uh, I don't see development wanting to be much taller than that uh, from the economic standpoint, <coughs> let alone uh, certainly you know, blocking views and things like that wouldn't make sense. So the existing buildings are really quite tall. When you look at some of them, they're, they're significant. So um, yeah, I apologize if it was a constraint. It was more of a, I think there's, there's definitely a lot of opportunities there. Mm -hmm. And a, a second question is, is that uh, I know you've got some of the old, and Mike too, but some of the old plats, and I think it would be terrific, and I'm, I, maybe this is a little self-serving, but it would be great if we could re-identify the lo original location of the McLaughlin House and have some mm -hmm. sort of yeah. outline of the building mm -hmm. or uh, something so that, because I get asked this all the time, right. and I can right. generally point to it on a map, but right. you know, I couldn't go down there today with the changes that have occurred since I saw where the original site was when it was still uh, publishers. So that would be something that would be really beneficial to our community because, you know, he is the founder of our city. He is the founder, basically the father of Oregon. And uh, having that marked in some way, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we do something where there's a structure there like at the end of the Hawthorne Bridge because I think that <laughs> people have opinions about that. But, but something that even, um, right. I think when I was in Austin, they had a, a, just a basic outline of a, of, a, of a building that used to be on the site, and there was some information about what was yeah. there, and so people could say, oh, okay. I mean, we have the house. We just don't have it back right there. Spot, right? And I get asked all the time, oh, now if this gets redeveloped, yeah. are you guys going to move it back down the hill? And I go, I don't think so. <laughs> Besides, that horse, that horse is dead, and... You know, right. Right. Take a little bit. But no, that sounds that sounds like a great idea, and it would also be a draw to bring people up to the house. Right? Exactly. So, right. was, yes. and take a look. so then the last yeah. question is: is that in looking over some of the prior material, I saw a lot of evidence of buildings that used to be on the on the site before the mill expanded, right. and one of the buildings that I was fell in love with, I will say, is where the. Uh, existing office building is. Now I know that that would be considered mid-century oh, modern yeah. and you know we have to understand the evolution mm -hmm. but that old post office yep. building there I was like why did we ever <laughs> tear that down? What is wrong with you know I again 30, 40, 50 years ago but right. that building same people who thought it was a good idea to put a dump at the end of the Oregon Trail, probably. Yes. <laughs> there you go. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So 
I, I mean, I had, I had some vision in my brain when we were I was talking with the other planning commissioners about wouldn't that be rebuild that, you know, similar style and size and mm -hmm. all that and have that be like a little hotel of some sort or, right. or a boutique hotel. Mm -hmm. But I guess what I wanted was your opinion on, you know, new construction. How can, how, what, would, what are some of your thoughts about how the architecture can appropriately reflect the history of the site? Yeah, I, mean, I, I know materials is one of them, but you know, mm -hmm. I don't think I want to see a big glass edifice there or something like that. But right. you know, right. but that's just me personally. I'm just kind of just, you know, and I'm not going to hold you to this or anything. Just mm -hmm. you know, well, I think you know. the Breer blocks is a really great example of that as well as far as that uh, there are, are elements that were 100% kept as was, and um, there are pieces of them that are still there. And then there's brand new modern buildings, right, right, kind of woven into it. And yeah. you know, to some degree, that's the texture that makes a city. That's that the, these 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 cities, these towns were built over time with a variety of styles and vernaculars, and and so to what we're showing is development it's going to take time to get through all of that and i think that that'll be actually a real plus as to how that kind of unfolds itself but there is great opportunities to use a lot of the bones that are there uh another good example that is in the very blocks is, is a, a whole food whole foods building that uses kind of the some piece of the skin but yet built yeah. a new building inside of it and functions really well as a as a market so um as well as just integrating renovation of the existing buildings so i'm not sure i'm going to have the answer for it but i think it definitely would allow for a, a mix of, of aesthetics mm -hmm. to go into there you, and and kind of keeping a lot of what's there to keep it authentic what do you what would you think about the idea of having some general parameters that would help people with the design such as some design guidelines some very basic ones that might we'd say you know look at these when you're thinking about design do you think something like that would be appropriate Absolutely, yeah, and that's that's really an important piece as we come down the road with this is to kind of try and figure out the best way to lay out the opportunity as well as maybe constraints isn't the right word, but certainly some guidelines is a good word for for you know what what the vision is and and how it starts to. My last itself. one is, how are you looking at the transition between downtown and then moving into this site? I think that uh, that street passage there is absolutely critical and and we showed it in some earlier slides one of the big advantages is it's not very far it's not a long distance across so that's a huge plus and i think that how we kind of treat that that surface uh uh that that passage across there will be really critical the the walk this and making sure that the traffic slowed down at that point is going to be critical but those first buildings right across the way are going to be really important absolutely I, critical i like the fact that you showed the slide with the the holly the Publishers sign Art across the street. Line. I love that they have one in downtown Bandon as you come into mm -hmm. Old Town Bandon, mm -hmm. and it's lit up at night, and it's it's pretty awesome. That's a great. Yeah. Jones. Yes. Go ahead, Bob. How many people do you anticipate uh, annually visiting this site? We've actually we've gone through some of the, the numbers just from the parking standpoint, just to um, uh, kind of start to build in some extra parking. We built in a, a fair amount of extra parking. But I don't know that I've got a number on on yeah, we're still, projections. You mean yet. to come to the falls or to come to visit? For just to come to the come to the site, uh, either as employees or tourists or just people going to the falls. We we're talking about uh, 100,000, 150, 200,000 people. We haven't looked at it in those terms. Yeah. What we've looked at is the Somebody amount. Somebody better. No, we will. We will. <laughs> what, we've, what we've looked at, and just to let you know, is we've looked at the potential of redevelopment of those blocks. And depending on what kind of use happens there, that will encourage a variety of different folks to come at different times. Uh, one of the traffic study things we're looking at is how, how much traffic is going to come through that area. So we're trying to anticipate right now the amount of visitation that would come to just see the falls and enjoy it. Uh, versus if there was, say, there's housing there, which would also attract people. Mm -hmm. So we're still working on trying to get to those numbers. Yeah, I would concentrate on just how many people come to see the falls, because that could be an international point of destination, yeah. which leads me to another question about, have you given any consideration to a possibility of a, uh, of a hotel there? Absolutely. And uh, a convention center? Convention center, we haven't specifically I'm looked at, but there's not a big one. I'm talking you know, about yeah, media, yeah. Vancouver has a convention. Conferencing center, convention center, mm -hmm. Vancouver, mm -hmm. USA. It's about that scale. It's appropriate. Now, have you given any consideration to, and I, I, I got to refer to Bouchard Gardens. It's reinvented itself since it passed on to the next generation, which was years ago, but now they're bringing in charter buses. I mean, there's 50 or 100, mm -hmm. well, not 100, but 50 charter buses. 
you know, I mean, that's just, that's just monstrous, you know, that, uh, but this is going to reinvent Oregon City, not just that site, but the whole downtown and the impact, the economic impact on that. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, then Rocky and I have discussed in, this in passing, and uh, I hope we're in lockstep, uh, Rocky, uh, public art. I think mm -hmm. public art is going to define the history of Oregon down there because I don't see it being redefined or carried on in historical uh, buildings because of the, of the public investment, stuff like that. But one of the greatest monuments that I've ever had the uh, honor to see in my lifetime was the wall in D.C. Mm -hmm. Just takes your breath away. Mm -hmm. You almost can't walk up to it. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see a wall of similar design show the history of the Oregon Trail from when they left to the last fish going over the falls or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So you might get some consideration. There, there won't be a last fish going over the falls. <laughs> 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 well, poor, poor choice of words. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I hear you. It's some, some way to really creatively demonstrate Yeah, because that would, uh, and, uh, that would, uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, if this thing is as successful as it could be, I mean, <laughs> my goodness gracious, you know, really. And then the, in closing, I think river traffic, bringing people from Portland mm -hmm. up the river mm -hmm. to see this thing. Yeah. You know, the jet boats come up. How far? Uh, you know, uh, come into the log. Yeah. Well, I can see the spirit of Portland or something like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Just having yeah. a, you know, mm -hmm. that yeah. kind of stuff. That's a great and water word. sports and things of this nature. So. Yeah. And somebody said something about a zip line. I won't say his name, but uh, well, he's not listening. But uh, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Damon. A um, couple of things. One, uh, I think, rather than the the wall, the Vietnam wall, the the one that's more along lines of what you're thinking is <coughs> the Korean War Memorial Wall, where it's got the the 3D Reflection. images, and I mean, it's just uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> Seeing that with the fog in the morning, it's creepy. Um, or eerie, I guess is better. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I can see what you're, what you're thinking, especially basically right along the, you know, potentially right along the, uh, the highway and the, the railroad wall. I mean, it's, it's a blank space. Um, has the, the old gas station that's yeah. not part yeah. of this property, um, has there been, and I guess it's kind of generic, has there been any discussion with integrating them into this project, or are they waiting to see how their property values skyrocket from all the development? And, I think that's probably you know, I mean, we're, 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 con we're continuing the outreach to them to try and bring them into the process. Um, we are working on contacting them and trying to update them. Because I can at. definitely see if they partner in on this, that oh, yeah. that's another large developable piece yeah. that can build an integrated piece rather than a building and, and mm -hmm. a building. Absolutely. Like a sore thumb. Right. Well, right. Not, I mean, it, it may be complementary, but I think you can get a better synergy yeah. if they're yeah. part of the team. Um, and speaking of historic buildings, um, or at least historic monuments, well, the, the picture you showed, uh, the black and white picture with the steamboats tied up, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In there somewhere is the McLaughlin House. I'd really love that picture to have it identified. Yeah, um, yeah. I can but, almost tell you where it is. I was yeah. looking at it really hard, trying to see if I could pick <laughs> yeah. it out. And it's an, actually it's a great it's example good. of how everything looks the same. Right. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that that uh, there's already a memorial down there, but it'd be interesting to integrate is uh, the old Oregon Mint, and uh, the you know the fact that. You know, we used to These mint coins. Go, you know, yep. coins here, and maybe that could be part of the souvenir thing is you come and get, you know, a replica coin. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, something, a lot of ideas there of what can be, be built, but mostly I was concerned about, you know, that little gas station block being part of it. Mm -hmm. And as far as traffic, I mean, I'd just point out there used to be 800 people a shift going in and out of there mm -hmm. at that very same only intersection. The city survived it then, will survive it again. <laughs> I mean, you know, people adjust and, um, you know, timing on lights and all that mm -hmm. may happen, but, you know, 
we, we've had high volumes of traffic in and out of there before and mm -hmm. we can do it again okay thanks sure again go well, ahead paul i'm assuming you guys looked at parking on this and yeah, we did. um mm -hmm. I, are, have you guys given any thought to using parking underground parking structures or partial underground parking structures as, as mitigation for yeah. for a flood i, I, I mentioned in there that um the uh the basalt makes it really difficult yeah. to build <laughs> right uh, great right. and then there's the areas of the catacombs that also kind of are environmental so we've really been looking at everything from on grade and above we have looked at it buffering on the back side um, when we've run our numbers and we've just been doing some basic round numbers we go up to maybe 800 850,000 square feet of development mm -hmm. that triggers about 1200 cars is what we're what we've got designed into yeah. there so there's a significant amount of parking and and the other plus I think in in this kind of development um, opportunity is the different times of day of uses of these certainly re re residential that, that leave when office shows up and then the weekends where you're a lot of your highest uses for the for the visitors mm -hmm. a lot of that's emptied out so there's yeah. some some really great synergy opportunity to mix those parking demands now, th this might be a bad thing to say but have you guys looked at the option of not having any cars there at all and just having it pedestrian oriented that was mentioned in one of the, the outreach we've, by we've discussed it but yeah. um, the reality of development is yeah. that right. we're an auto oriented society and uh, so if if the you know if the decision was not to bring cars on the site it wouldn't redevelop I yeah. mean, you, so it just True. kind of the reality of how it works just curious yeah, yeah. no it's been discussed in terms of parking I think there are other places you could look at outside the site uh, absolutely that's uh, what we we're trying to say yeah. pedestrian a pedestrian <laughs> thing over highway 99 e closing off that Tumwater piece there and having parking on and that mm -hmm. uh, look and on that road I mean I think there are other options where are other people options. are going to walk a little ways and still have a place to park that's not that far away yeah and what's been found in other areas similar is that people will walk about 10 minutes that's about as far as they'll walk to you know to come and feel comfortable yeah. and so uh, that slide we showed that that was about a 10 minute walk all the way across <laughs> your downtown so there's plenty of places that you can get within that location but in order to have development occur um, beyond the visitation for vis uh, you know for tourism you're gonna need vehicles and parking on the site we believe Rocky, I saw him. Yeah, and I, I was <laughs> I'm reluctant to say anything because I'm afraid if I start, I'll stop. I won't stop. Um, yeah, I, I, so, I mean, um, I, I get so I, I won't say much, but um, some of the things that have already been mentioned, I, I agree fully with. I, I definitely um, want to see it. A combination of old and new and um, in some cases some cases where the old doesn't exist some somehow try to, to, to show where it was in the case of the buildings that have been brought up at the Opera House and the Electric Hotel things that reference some base some massive history that we all talk about every day but we can't really show anybody where it was I think that's crucial um, I think the whole piece about um, uh, pedestrian bicycle etc but also really focusing on the river river ri the river use because we we um, constantly talk about um, you know how we're going to get access to the falls but also how do we get the way to do that is the way we've done it in all the entire history of the city which is the river and the, the locks and um, so um, seeing that upper basin being a boat basin much like it was where we have so many opportunities in recent history that people have wanted to bring us boats to this town to open to the public but we have no place for them or a way to keep them and i, I could just see um, i've mentioned this before almost like a um, an area like um, um, San Francisco with the wharf and the the museum that they have there with the the the, the boats and ships that are there um, I could see that very much so here um, I, I think what you've proposed here and, and just shown us just showed some of the basic visuals it's so exciting um, that that's why I've kind of not said much because it's so exciting um, you know see starting to see these visuals um, in much of the way that I've dreamed about them or drawn them out um, and some of the same ways of seeing the visuals of what the library could be 
it then starts becoming reality and it, it starts becoming um, something that you can really see. Um, it's uh, amazing to have lived in this town and always dreamed about it and now here it is. And um, I don't want to stop talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and unfortunately my family has spent you know, a fair amount of time um, you know, convincing me that um, maybe moving to other places in the country or moving to other places outside of Oregon City would be the best solution for my life. Um, and I've, I've greatly considered it many, many times, but it's so hard to do it when you see this. Um, I may never leave this town, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's just incredible. Um, so I appreciate everybody's comments. I just encourage everybody. It's, it's amazing how many people on the street just want to talk about it. Um, you know, at school, at work, everywhere you go. And I just want to keep conveying to people, please, you know, get involved. Please, uh, it's not too late to keep going to these open houses and these yes. meetings and um, to draw up your own plans and to, to think about what this place could be because it's, it's incredible. Comments? Yes, go ahead, Bob. Have you given any consideration to a planned unit development concept on that property? The reason I asked the question is I was surprised to find out that the streets have been vacated. And mm -hmm. if they're vacated, uh, the public really doesn't have any uh, oh, muscle, in a sense, to say, this is where the utilities are going to go, and this is where the circulation plan is going to go, and this is where your building is going to be located. And so I would suggest that you might just sort of uh, ask the uh, who's ever going to be the developer. They're either going to sell pieces of property off to investors to develop themselves, or they're going to come up with a complete master plan of how they see the property developed. And we're going to be more or less uh, at their disposal to, to approve that. But at least it would be organized up front and we'd know what we were dealing with. <coughs> right now, we're dealing with it here and I don't see the investor at this table saying that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. But if you had a planned unit concept development there that you could apply as a zone and he, he could then say either we're gonna develop it ourselves or we're gonna sell it off piecemeal and the developer has agreed that he's going to bring this in and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and treat that as an individual zone with uh, uh, with uh, uses that are applicable to that zone yeah right now what we're doing is obviously establishing a framework and yeah. then that framework will be well adopted. the devil's in the details yeah, absolutely the, and when you uh, consider that those streets are vacated now you got a whole situation confronting you where the utility is going to go those easements mm -hmm. and things of that nature right definitely the developer is going to be looking for uh, that public private partnership so they'll need those utilities and yes. they might uh, you know, be willing to say uh, tell us where you'd like them to be mm -hmm. um, uh, so there there's definitely going to be some some huge value in that discussion to the developer as well I see your hands out in the audience but I want to circulate through here between the Commission members before we take additional public comment uh, Kathy. Oh, okay. Um, I'm wondering if this has been looked at from the environmental side, the environmental issues as to improving habitat for salmon and the eel and things like that, leading to the design considerations, like we're talking about the tail races, uh, maybe going back to the natural ways that the salmon were able to access the upper river. So is that being considered in this? Well, um, Absolutely, the habitat and value for for salmon and migratory birds is part of the part of the uh, plan, and uh, the idea of where the salmon go. Uh, we met with PGE and talked about the fish ladder and and talked to the state, and they're very uh, interested in continuing to have them use the fish ladder because that's a place that uh, is actually navigable and easy to easy to route. And uh, one of the things that they're concerned about is kind of confusing. The route because mm -hmm. uh, it does work mm -hmm. so well mm -hmm. um, so because uh, that was one of our thoughts originally was well let's start bringing water through the lagoon mm -hmm. and bring it down so through there but when you start to look at the elevational drop and uh, the time of year when it's actually available and that sort of thing 
uh, they strongly encouraged us uh, to stay just with what's there. Stay with what's see. there and allow water to come through and not only clean up the lagoon water by letting it flush through like it used mm -hmm. to, but bringing that uh, water out through the tail races into the river. There's a there's a place that the fish like to rest and, right. and use mm -hmm. that fresh water coming mm -hmm. through. Yeah, that's so, what I was talking about a resting space. Yeah, but uh, there's yeah anyway. And then, which tribes are actively involved in this so far? Well, that's <laughs> um, the uh, confederated tribes of the Grand Ron um, have been discussed. Those are the folks that we're out meeting with, mm -hmm. with the mayor and others. Uh, the other tribes have been contacted. So there's been a, an ongoing conversation, and there's uh, some real sensitivity between the different groups. Mm -hmm. That's my, my the reason I'm asking the <laughs> question. Yes. <laughs> yes, so they're very sensitive, but uh, the, the cities and uh, their partners have been very, um, I think, open and uh, to the dialogue with, with all of them. So that's been an open conversation. But right now, the, the, uh, the uh, Grand Ronde folks have been the ones that have been really at kind of coming to the site and talking about it. So have there's, has there been much more of a push um, to engage the others more actively? They've been invited. Well, I know they've been invited. Sometimes being married to one of them. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, uh, an invitation doesn't always work. Yeah, <laughs> I, what, I was, what I was going to say, I, I, and I think I won't say it, uh, was made very, very clear uh, with our discussions of the with the council, uh, and I'm talking about the the council of the confederated tribes, the Grand Ron. It is their site, and they invited people to use it with it traditional. And I think they still look upon it that way. Um, and uh, I, I think I think we, we we have to be very cognizant of that mm -hmm. concern on their part. It is their ceded territory. Uh, I think I think they're doubly uh, sensitive to that because uh, that that sea of territory was essentially denied them in the 1950s, and then they they got it back. Uh, and uh, so I, I think they'd be very very sensitive to that. And um, I think we have to really respect that sensitivity, uh, particularly if they intend to be an investor in that area. Um, uh, I, I think they recognize that that was a meeting place of many, many peoples uh, for fishing and so forth, but uh, it is it is something I think we need to be very, very sensitive to. Uh, and they brought it up as a sensitive issue. Um, I, I agree. There's also some things so going on in the background that I think that we need to be cognizant of um, in the Native community all over this Northwest region that uh, especially Abdullah recent, very recently. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we need to continue to make an effort to bring these other tribes in, um, not just make it a blank invitation. So we've, um, the mayor sent um, invitations to each of the um, five tribes in the, in the region. We've had considerable interaction with Grand Ronde. We've had interaction with Yakima, and we've actually taken Umatilla on site. Um, so we are mm -hmm. trying to engage the best that we can um, and, and incorporate uh, and invite them into this process. Okay. Uh, do you know if the Cascade Band has been there from the Umatilla? Uh, I took Terry and Farm out. Okay. That's good. Um, I, uh, just on the trail races, and uh, it's just an idea. It's a thought. But... Um, if, they're, if they're intended to be uh, serve some, as some cold water refuges, I think where the water comes from is important. And I presume lower in the water column, it's going to be colder. Yeah, if, you take, uh, if you take it off the surface, then I don't think you're going to attract Outside anything. So I'm sure a lot of thought's been given to that. Um, any, any other comments? Bob's comment, how do, we, how do we strike out the balance of what we want to see and from a developer standpoint, what is practical? And uh, um, we all have various dreams there, and the developer will have certain goals of their own. And uh, how do we how do we frame a master plan in such a way that uh, there is that degree of flexibility in it that guarantees some of the concerns that Bob brought forward and that we've all brought forward in terms of how different 
pieces of it were going to be used in the practic practicality. We recognize it's probably going to be a long-term development in any case, mm -hmm. but uh, how, how do we do that? Well, that's exactly what we're in the process of doing, and what we're attempting to do is establish a framework that embodies uh, the four core values in a way that will work for the community and work for the developer. Uh, since we don't have a developer at the table yet, we yeah. may have one soon, yeah. uh, we hope that that person or people get involved. Um, and as Kevin mentioned, uh, frankly, the only way this site's going to work for anybody is a public-private partnership, just like any other development that people love to go to nowadays in other communities. And so we think uh, the city will have a very willing participant um, that, frankly, will, uh, will want to work with the, with the community uh, to make their project work. Uh, the, the conversation of architecture and how do we keep the character of that, uh, the idea of uh, guidelines and kind of structure to that, we think is a really good idea. So we try to embody that, the, the goodness, if you will, of the site in there. And uh, ours is just the first step. So the framework plan is going to be established, but eventually there's going to have to be a detailed master plan coming in from the developer, and that's where things will be fleshed out. So there's, a, there's many steps to be had. We just want to establish a really strong uh, framework plan today that uh, will allow the developer the opportunity to make, make a living, which is important, but uh, uh, make sure that the uh, kind of the goodness of the site comes through too. I think um, just folks are watching what's going on. And I've had some initial phone call with uh, Liam Thornton. He's with Langley Investment Development. And one of the things, a couple of the points that we took away from it was they've been following the process. They, they appreciate the direction that it's going and that a public-private partnership is needed in order to make this site all that it can be. So, you know, I think we're setting very good building blocks for when those harder discussions and negotiations and decisions need to be made. Um, I think we have these, the four values, and we've always had them as a circle, and we never had this hierarchy or ranked them, and they all kind of overlap in that middle. And I think, you know, one of the one of the reminders was at some point, they overlap, and some hard decisions are going to have to be made. And so, this is kind of that high level. Let's get started. Let's get an understanding of the property. Let's get an understanding of what the vision is for the community. How does that relate to what's actually feasible in the market? And then we'll start to drill down on that. Um, remember also with the agreement with uh, Mr. McKittrick, um, we look forward to the private side coming into this process and being a part of it. And if Langley is successful, uh, we'll hope that they'll take Peter's position at the table with us so that we can continue to strengthen this partnership that we have with, with Metro and the county and, and the state. And as you may recall, when we kind of started this before we sent out the RFP, it was certainty with flexibility. And so this is our opportunity here to kind of check in and make sure that, you know, folks are comfortable with the direction that we're heading. Um, you, know, you saw a little bit of kind of this, it's, it's very high level. And Mr. Mo Bob brings up some very good points about some of these details that we just don't have answers to yet. I think we're, we're, we're putting together op options, opportunities, identifying some of those constraints and realizing that we're going to, you know, additional work is going to be needed over multiple years on this project. Um, and also that there, there's two products coming out of this. One is, is dealing with the entitlements and the land use, and the other is the strategy document. And that's looking at, you know, what are our funding opportunities? It's, it's not saying this is the one way to do it. It's saying here are the 15 options. And then when you get to the next step, here are some more options. And it's going to be putting those tools together in a way that works. Um, and so that'll be another product here that will hopefully provide some clarity and some more ability to make some better decisions as we move forward with those, with those next steps for implementation. Mayor, if I might also add to that, the concern about this example of the flexibility is you don't see in the framework so far actual designs on the various buildings that could be repurposed. But what you do see, the certainty with flexibility, the certainty you see is a street grid, the restoration of that street grid I've seen in virtually every presentation. So I think we're making that point to them that you get flexibility here, but you don't have it there. And so then our zoning co code that will follow up this plan will further solidify that. And like any development, any 23-acre development, we're going to be able to exact some right-of-way accommodations from it. 
and this way we're simply saying where we want those to be and it's not that different from our transportation master plan where we articulate where we want those things to be and uh, only in those cases we generally don't have uh, you know public money we already have five million from the state we think there will be additional money later from other sources so there's going to be a series of hammers and sticks and carrots and things like that to, to encourage um, us to get what we want uh, in this project so no, that's right that's right I think uh, and I noticed restoring the rocky habitat I don't know if you caught that, yeah, but that was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't Rocky apostrophe S. <laughs> no, <laughs> just um, that's why he's never going to move. One more quick follow up too on a, on a one of the questions about parking and being able to utilize um, maybe up by Tumwater or other additional parking you're using our downtown area. Well, that was actually one of the questions that we asked during our survey, and of the there were 1,943 people responded to it. 25 percent would be willing to walk 10 blocks to get to the site. 48% would be willing to walk five blocks. So it does show that, mm -hmm. that you know, mm -hmm. there is a, a willingness in order to access the site. They're just kind of lazy. <laughs> 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 only 6% yeah. they would only park on And the then when we, talk yeah, about right. that, when we talk about that housing component, yeah. they're not going to want to walk the five blocks. No. So, well, so no. we're going to have to get something system. back against yeah. the bluff that well, tucks well, in there yeah. and makes use of the natural features. Yes. And Absolutely looks good and provides parking. I yes. mean, that's nothing money can't solve, I think. <laughs> Doug, I just yeah. wanted to um, thank Kathy for, uh, again, bringing up about uh, the first peoples that were on the site yeah. because, you know, a lot of people in our community forget that our history didn't begin when jo Dr. John McLaughlin right. put his sawmill sure. there in 1829, but that there were a whole other group of people here living their lives and enjoying the site long before That's right. us folks <laughs> showed up and and that that to me is is that is a major component of the story of the of this place and that it's very very important that we don't you know in any way leave that out but the one thing I was reminded of something I was at a meeting yesterday with Alice and you know we have to remember that although this was Grand Ron seated territory uh, you know, one Native American person doesn't speak for all Native American people. Exactly. So we, we have to deal with the, the core group that's here, but I, I appreciate the fact that you um, are looking at other options of reaching out. And Alice has, um, with the Willamette Falls Heritage Area, has some really good contacts. And I don't know if you've talked to her, Mike or Kevin, about who she's talked to, but, you know, maybe there's, you know, we're not we don't want to reinvent the wheel because right. you know it seems right. like everybody's going there to talk to them about well what do you want what do you you know and I'm sure they're getting pretty darn sick of it um, which be. she told us that they kind of are in a way mm -hmm. but we still need their input and we still need to make sure that their story mm -hmm. is told here which is again like I said is a major component of, of of the story that we have to tell the pioneer part is actually really small right. compared to that prehistory and I should point out when I was when we were there at the <coughs> At the tribal headquarters there, there was a picture of a falls, but it was Salilo Falls. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And so I mean, these these were these are tremendous meeting places of many people. Many so people. Yeah. Yes, uh, exactly. I, I think we recognize that. I like uh, that slogan though. Which. The a meeting place of many people. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> other, Break that other, down. other, I want to be sure to get the rest of the yeah. public involved. But anything else from I just, the two commissions? What, what, once again, I just wanted to make sure that we generally have consensus and agreement that we're heading in the right direction, that the product you're seeing is going in the right, what you're expecting or, and whatnot. So, and Charles, we more. Well, I, I just uh, was curious uh, between now and, and when this is actually formally presented, are, are we looking at uh, a framework that has multiple options built into it or is it a framework plan uh, that just focuses on one particular direction it focuses on the direction we're showing you uh, but within that framework there's lots of things that can occur so essentially what we're what's in the framework is pedestrian access and, and restoration of the riverbank and connections of people to the falls that's a that's a core framework element how that routes through I showed you three different three routes grid. that could occur in a variety of ways we're saying in the framework that street grid specifically Main Street uh, water and forth should be streets and provide access 
The other ones should be at least visual corridors. They could be vehicular. They should be pedestrian, that kind of thing. And then beyond that, there's all kinds of flexibility. So where there is a framework structure, but then there's lots of flexibility within it. That, that's good. That's what I was hoping is that we don't uh, narrow the uh, options down too much that mm -hmm. the developers locked in. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I did want to uh, just compliment uh, thus far, I think uh, Walker Macy and GBD have done an a excellent job of uh, uh, bringing together all the uh, uh, goals and objectives and the vision and the public comments and, and I think uh, it's very encouraging to see the direction you're going with the plan. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I think we think it's an awesome site by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's also good to remind th that there are the other nuts and bolts. You know, we're dealing with ODOT and the comprehensive plan amendment and the zone change, uh, the MMA designation. You know, so there are other not quite so flashy things that are actually very beneficial, we believe, to the property that, that will hopefully knock down some of those barriers to that private reinvestment back into that property. Tony, what's the MMA I think again? that uh, mixed use multi or multimodal multimodal, multimodal mixed, mixed use, use area. area. Just make sure you say it out loud because other people will think it's the mixed martial arts or something. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like that way sometimes. Sometimes <laughs> just to say it. It's more <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're the MMA too. We don't we don't fight. Well, I uh, I don't think that we should forget the essential component of this whole. Uh, adventure is that the investor is out to make money and that's fine because without doing that this property would not develop and of course it's the American way but I think in order to uh, gain his confidence that he ought to be convinced that we are uh, determined to put people on that site on the ac the public access that public access is going to function for him in terms of uh, the return on his investment because they're going to represent consumers and when I say it's going to reinvent Oregon City it, it will I mean if people are going to walk 10 blocks down Main Street they're going to stop at a bar or a restaurant now me I'd probably stop at <laughs> but I mean if that's emphasized it's going to give him the confidence to say the city is is uh, uh, is looking out for my uh, financial interests you know, we, we call it call it what it is. It's an investment on both sides of the of the street. Mm -hmm. You see. So, and, and in closing, keep in mind, folks, we're we're laughing here, and we're supporting each other. But there's going to be a time mm -hmm. where we're going to flex our muscles in in a public uh, interest, and and things are going to come get a little tight amongst us. But we'll get through it. I helped develop 680 acres of a planned unit development and things got a little tight, meetings got a little long and uh, people that were shaking hands when they came through the door were going out separate doors but it's just people being people. You know, we'll get through this. Uh, we won't. Four or five other councils and commissions and planning commissions <laughs> will. Okay, And the one, the one gorilla in, in the room is this economy. You see, yes. if the economy was free and flowing you know, we'd, they'd be busting down the door to get here, but they're very cautious. So we've got to be cognizant of that. But if you put souls on that site, either a, a tourist or a cover, uh, or just somebody out for a weekend drive, they're still a consumer, and that investor wants to know that and that we're we've got his we've got his back, but we're also protecting the public's back because a lot of public money is going to go into this too. So, thank you for listening. I, Talk too much. <laughs> Anybody else before we take some public comment? I just have one thing. Yes, go say. ahead. Um, so when we talk about certainty with uh, flexibility, that I feel that also applies to developers. They have a certain amount of certainty with mm -hmm. um, the plan, seeing that there's open space that will bring people to the site, and also having that environmental assessment already done and the different studies. So I think it works both ways. It's oh, really? for the public um, and also for development. So it, it's a give and take there. Well, I'm going to take this moment because we're going to have to use a mic. Now, you go ahead and sit there because you may want to comment on it. 
and take a moment also because we don't see a person very often at the city commission meetings but Carrie Richer who works with our is an attorney that works primarily with our planning uh, admission and welcome and I would wonder if you would be willing to ha share your microphone with somebody that came up or whether we have the portable available we'd be happy to do that well, you, you can sit there and they can just lean over you. <laughs> <laughs> See who it is. William, 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 you have not been invited up here yet. <laughs> William, would you like to take a seat? <laughs> Since he's the only public we have. Use that there. Since, I was the, since I was the only member of the public here, I assume when you were the public that I was... I was <laughs> well, there are people that are staff, but they might feel that they have a stake too, you know. Oh, and, they, and they do. <laughs> and they do. Uh, I just wanted to address uh, two, oh, actually it's a single area, for, but two different components that I don't know were explored as, as, uh, as deeply as possible. And one is, I think you just turned it on. Thank you. Um, they both have to do with transportation. One area is um, the river and the, and and there's two aspects to that. One is when we get the locks open, and we will, mm -hmm. uh, whether we own them or not, that's, you know, and that's a distinct possibility as well. In addition to just the tourist traffic of bringing up the jet boats and, and like that, there's also various serious talk about moving goods up and down the river in a commercial aspect from Wilsonville to Portland. Why can't they be making a stop here as well? And I would certainly like to hope in somewhere in the plans that there is a docking facility where some goods could be loaded onto some sort of uh, a, a river conveyance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of, of some sort. And I haven't heard that discussed. I mean, we've talked about docks for pleasure boats, mm -hmm. but let's get commercial into the aspect as, as well, at least as a consideration. On the other side, uh, the other uh, transportation issue that I didn't hear uh, mentioned uh, in any depth is rail traffic. And that also is both mm -hmm. for uh, for pleasure <laughs> and for and for uh, transportation of goods. Mm -hmm. And that I know we used to, you know, we, I guess we still have some vacated spurs down there. Mm -hmm. But the idea of being able to, if we have some light manufacturing down there and they want access to to a freight, I think that would be a big plus if we at least considered the possibility yeah. of having rail down there. Also, we want to make sure that there that it is. Um, that there is some sort of a transportation, and I'm not promote, promoting the idea of a train station down there. We've got a great location for a train station, but some tie-in to, uh, to passenger as well as freight. And so those are two transportation issues on either side of the site that I didn't hear explored too much. Mm -hmm. Those are the only comments I had. Thank you. <coughs> well, I'm glad you ended up with that point because yeah. there's something that we're going to need to lobby on, and it's indirectly associated with it, but that is the, uh, for the, um, I'll, well, I'll call it the Amtrak ra rail system that's being developed. The, the, the systems that are coming through now that are all be being identified are through or near Oregon City. However, there's no guarantee that we get a station in the process. And so uh, I, think, I think this piece is a, a critical piece in our discussion point that we are going to be a destination point and not having a station here would be a detriment. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this, is, this is something I think we have to start thinking about and lobbying yeah. about very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very good. Go ahead, anybody. I'll leave it to you, Tony. I actually think I have oh, okay, go ahead. Um, speaking to what uh, Mr. Gifford said, I'd, I will point out that I brought up the whole don't lose the spur line at the uh, Museum of the Oregon Territories. I mean, it's it's a good mm -hmm. option to keep alive. I hadn't really thought about water trade, but um, after you mentioned it, I was mentioning to Paul, the Building O um, is actually a really good location because a barge or something could pull up there, a crane could come out of the building right into a warehouse set setting or a distribution setting, whatever that may be. Um, because it's right there on the water, it'd be very easy to, to convert that to some sort of uh, thing. The big question that nobody's mentioned about all the water traffic is is draft. Um, mm -hmm. Since there isn't regular barge traffic going up and down the river anymore, they haven't been dredging the river 
and I'm not sure what and how deep anything can be that comes up past uh, Milwaukee and, and the Narrows mm -hmm. up there. So um, that may be another element of talking with not ODOT, but uh, you know the the state and uh, federal. Corridor uh, here. The yeah. 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 But you know, the other thing is you just get a three foot boat to go through with a good prop wash, followed by a four foot boat with a good prop wash. <laughs> <laughs> I I remember doing that more than once in the Navy with landing craft. So it's amazing what natural uh, channels appear after a little while. But I will tell you that all through that period of time, the discussion was going. We had aggregate uh, barges going through and they were a major mm -hmm. pusher for keeping those locks open. I'm, I'm sure you're right, there are some, some kinds of commercial activities that just won't, won't work in those locks anymore, but barge traffic does. Yeah. He's talking about Wilsonville Cement. Yeah. I'm just talking about getting a tugboat yes. up to get into the barges right now. The draft is so bad in the river, but we can make it happen. So we alter. any other before we kind of close out for the night here? This is a great discussion. Words. I, I wanted to comment. I, I had a comment on that uh, last public meeting that I attended, which was the one there at, uh, uh, at the Tumwater Room at the Museum of the Oregon Territory. Uh, I've never seen such an excited group in my <laughs> life. And the working groups, those individual tables, uh, I, I've seen that occur sometimes but they worked all right this worked tremendously well I mean there were ideas coming out and after the meeting was uh, after the meeting was over people were refusing to leave they're all standing at the chart <laughs> pictures the dialogue kept on going yeah. uh, I I was so excited about that uh, meeting I thought man we really got something going I want to congratulate you guys on, yeah. on how you put that together how it how it permitted the whole flow of ideas to come through uh, yeah so uh, it was a it was it was a great thing and you know I think when the interviews at various levels were occurring as to who should come forward I think you were at the top of the list on everybody's on everybody's uh, list and now I can see why. You've done a tremendous public outreach, public participation. I'm saying all thank kinds of good things about you, incidentally, uh, as you're coming through. There she goes. And it, 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 it was a tremendous credit to the work that you've done. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And we'll continue to do it. Um, if I could echo on that, Mayor. I mean, I think it echoes what I said, you yeah. sure are. <laughs> um, I think it might be a good idea or appropriate for the city to send a letter to the Minnesota graduates yes. for the work that they did. Uh, they didn't have to do anything, um, mm -hmm. but they did, and they and they stepped up. And I know it was just a, a uh, graduate school group or whatever, so there there'd at least be one focus you, know, you could send that letter to. I think it'd be uh, you know a, a good thing on their part. If I were you guys, I'd get a tape of that applause because it might not happen again. Can I just ask one question? Now this property is still private. It's mm -hmm. it's not public. We don't have any um, urban renewal funds available. It's not in the urban renewal district. So how do we plan to address that? We do have some. I think that what a part of this is the strategy document is looking at what are what are the options available to to us, to the developer, to our partners on trying to move forward. And so it's not something that we're going to answer right now. I think okay. it's laying out what the options available to us might be. Okay. I'm, I, if I'm, I, am, I think I'm correct in saying this vertical housing district that we formed extends all the way through that side and all the way down through the cove and through the whole It doesn't area. extend on the Blue Heron site because it was zoned general industrial. Oh, didn't it, have the didn't, yeah. it did not extend. But, but that could still be done. And I might mention and follow up to Commissioner Mom's question, we do have the partnerships pledge from each right. of the partners and then right. we have the $5 million identified from the state. So okay. there is a little bit of seed money there by which we hope to lever other money. Okay, eventually. that's perfect. So just a little bit of reminders just for uh, all of you are well aware but for those watching and we'll hopefully click on the tape to watch it please go to rediscoverthefalls.com best way to stay involved in the process see what the upcoming events are the survey is still online uh, so you can take the survey if you haven't done so 
Um, and also, just one more plug that this Thursday, December 12th, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Ainsworth House, which is at 19130 Lot Wickham Drive in Oregon City, we'll be having our, our third uh, open house community interactive event. And then just echoing um, what Doug said earlier, um, I really do appreciate um, and admire the work that's been done by Ken and Mike and Ellen and Kevin, and there's a large team yeah. behind them that they're managing as well that are bringing this all together in a very, very condensed timeline. Um, I think they've far exceeded the expectations and have really just embraced this program and this project. And um, I think it shows in what you're seeing, not only from the community, but in the products that you're bring, being brought forward. So I just really do want to thank them for the incredible hard work that they've put into this to get us to where we're at Absolutely. right now. Yeah. And Last thing is for last but not least, since it's the holidays and I know you all want nice reading materials to mm -hmm. take up your free time. Absolutely. Uh, Commissioner Roth actually asked for these hard copies. We thought it was a great idea, so we have those. Please hang on to these because they're actually on both sides and they're color and they're really nice. So this will get you basically what you saw tonight, but you'll be able to see it and work on it and oh, brainstorm with it as you go. So this is the information <laughs> that, that we have with our with our partners group uh -huh. when we meet with them. So this is the same information that we've given to them. Yeah, and I okay. saw this online Wait, and it's just... It's a lot. It's yeah. a lot, but it's, it's also a, just beautiful. It is. Yes. <laughs> so that's all that we have for tonight. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back. Good.